can I, uh, we're now going to hear uh, three very short uh, presentations uh, from experts in their field. So, uh, Abby Billinghurst runs a, a charity, or an, well, it's not a charity, but an organization called Abianda, which works with young girls who've been uh, the victims of organized uh, exploitation in, in gangs in the main. Uh, and she will speak first. Then after Ab Abby, uh, Lucy Shuka, who's a senior research fellow at the University of Bedfordshire, will speak about the research that she's doing in relation to exploitation of children. And then we want to get the practitioner's experience. So uh, Jim uh, Hatton is sergeant here in Leicestershire. Uh, in fact, a fan of Leicestershire. In fact, he told me that he got married in this pretty building. Forgive me. <laughs> uh, and he will give you uh, a few minutes, really, about what it, the police officer's experience is in this area. So let's please hear from uh, Abby Billinghurst. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thanks very much, Nazir. Um, I'm delighted to be here, it's all very exciting. Thanks YJB for uh, asking me. I'm Abby Billinghurst, and yes, I'm the founder and director of a social enterprise called Abby Anda. Um, we work with young women who are affected by gangs and with the professionals that support them. So we have a range of services and projects for young women and also training and commercial products for, for professionals in order that people feel more skilled and equipped to respond effectively to young women who are affected by gangs. Um, I set up the organization about just under four years ago with the aim to bring about a culture shift in the way that services are delivered to young women in order that they felt safer to access services and that we as practitioners and service providers felt more equipped and confident to respond effectively to them. Um, I think it's probably important to give you a, a, an idea of scale of our organization. We're tiny. Um, we are, at any given time, between two members of staff to six members of staff. Three of those are young women who've used our service and who are now coming up and moving into uh, professional responsibilities. Last year, we worked with 50 young women, high-risk, high-vulnerability young women, and trained 500 um, practitioners. We're based in Islington in London, where we've been developing our model of practice. Uh, testing out new work, building up really robust partnerships with the local authority and statutory agencies there. Um, and we're about to move into two new boroughs and have all sorts of wonderful plans for growth over the next, next three years. Um, but So our scale at the moment is small in terms of our reach, but actually the depth of impact that we're having for young women seems to be really quite significant. And I'll try and speak to you a little bit about that today. So I'm gonna bring a practitioner voice. I'm a youth worker um, who's gone into running an organization um, and also a sort of service delivery voice in, into this conversation. And I really hope that's of use, of interest to you kind of going forward into the rest of the, into the, rest of the convention. Um, so the young women we work with talk about navigating a war zone on their doorsteps. Um, and while sexual exploitation is absolutely and quite rightly a headline issue that we should be tending to in the context of young women's experiences in gangs, we're finding that the reason that the majority of young women are referred into us is not because of sexual exploitation. It's because they're involved in county line activity. It's because they're in a relationship with a high-risk gang nominal or having a child or pregnant with, with that male. Um, it's because they're holding weapons, um, they're cooking drugs in trap houses, but what's consistent across all of those reasons for referral is the inherent and normalized exploitation in all sorts of different forms that those young women are experiencing. So just going into this conversation, I think so important that we have a really broad spectrum um, of, of understanding about how young women are affected in this context of gangs, which is what we're focusing on uh, in my organization. So. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what young women tell us are the obstacles that they face in accessing services. We normally co-deliver with young women, but I apologize, we couldn't quite make it work today to get a young woman here. And then I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about our model and how our principles and our model of practice and the culture of our organization tries to tackle some of these obstacles that young women face in, in, getting, in getting help. <clears throat> the young women that we work with have got a history of non-engagement. 
Um, and we know that still gang-affected young women still aren't coming forward to access services as we would hope. We're still not identifying them as proactively as we could across our systems. And young women tell us that they don't trust that services can keep them safe. They tell us that they'd rather navigate the risks that they face in their lives on their own or within their peer groups rather than bring service provision into their life because of a fear that that will result in their risk escalating. So that's one of the first obstacles that young women are facing and that young women talk to us about, and very much that they've been let down in the past, and many of those things that Nazir was talking about in terms of our perception and judgments of young women impacting on their ability to come forward. Um, and then the dynamics of power and control, and actually how often do we think about dynamics of power and control between service deliverer and service provider? And this is something as an organization we're really reflective um, on. But young women talk to us about when they enter into services, when they do engage, that the risk management that goes on around them, which needs to happen, absolutely, means an end result of that is that they lose power and control of processes. They don't know what's being done with their personal information. Young women talk, talk to us consistently about a lack of transparency about who professionals are talking to, hopefully in support of that young woman, but that young woman's left out of the loop. Um, and therefore the subsequent fear of whose, whose hands is that information going to get into and, and living with that uncertainty and that anxiety as to the consequences that's going to have on her um, and, and her networks. But also one of the challenges that young women talk about is many services success criteria is for young women to disclose. Either disclose on traumatic experiences that have taken place in their past or give up information about their associates who all pose significant risk to them. And that's in direct, um, that, that success criteria we have as service providers is actually really contradicts young women's, that, that they tell us, um, needs when they come into a service. Yes, some young women do want to talk, are ready to give up lots of information, but many young women want to come into a service without that demand on them, without having to go back into past traumas and without feeling the fear and threat of associates of snitching. Um, and then thirdly, one of the, 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 the headline barriers that young women are facing that they talk to us about is that more often than not, young women um, and the services around them are focused on them as an individual and there's a danger that that young woman becomes the problem rather than the context within which they're operating and where the risk and the harm is presented. And where we can't reach into those contexts to try and make those spaces safer, we focus on the young woman and for her to be the person who makes changes. And young women talk to us about the impact of that being that they become pathologized, don't necessarily use that word, um, that, that, that's full of judgments and ultimately they're to blame and they're responsible somehow for the abuse and the harm that they're experiencing. And I know Lucy and Carleen Furman and colleagues at the University of Bedfordshire are doing a huge amount of work now around contextualised safeguarding, which I think is absolutely um, uh, relevant and significant for all of our work. Um, so, I made, how do we deal with these barriers and things similar to this that young women are talking to us about? When I set up the organisation, I made three defining choices about how we would run. And these choices would influence the culture of our organisation, but also our trajectory of growth. And I'm going to just quickly talk to you about that first one, about the importance for me about us working shoulder to shoulder with the young women uh, that, we're, that we're working with. Young women more than anyone, I'm preaching to the converted, but young women more than anyone know the challenges they face in their life. They walk in their shoes 24, hour day, 24 hours um, a day. They are, of course, the experts um, of their life. And so it's logical to me that we would embed those experts in our organization, that they'd be part of the fabric of what we're doing, they'd be helping us steer the ship, and, and making sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, and when we're thinking about our business strategy, that we're responding to the realities of young women's lives and lived experiences. We're not making assumptions as service providers or professionals to say, well, I think that's the problem, therefore this is the plan I'm going to put in place. Because actually then we go off on two different paths. The young woman's that way, we're going that way. And as much as possible, we're walking shoulder to shoulder with young women, learning from her as to how we now need to shift and iterate our services to respond to her needs. Our model of practice is rooted in youth work principles 
and participation principles and theory. And we use solution-focused therapy techniques embedded in all of that to work with young women. And so that means that we're strengths-based, we're future-focused, we're really interested in the life that the young woman wants to have in the future, rather than getting stuck in the problems that actually us as professionals also probably get stuck in sometimes too. And so we have a fundamental belief in her competence and her belief and her ability to be an active uh, agent in the change process as we go forward in whatever social sphere she's uh, operating in. And so being shoulder to shoulder with young women means culturally as an organization, we have to be willing to relinquish power and control to the young women that we are working with and trying to reach. We know that girls and young women, children, who have been in the context of gangs, who've experienced a vast range of trauma and abuse, potentially, those experiences are defined by a lack of power and control. So it's absolutely crucial as service providers, we are creating spaces where young women can take back power and control, where they can have their rights met, and where they can actually be supported to influence the decisions that affect their lives. And these are all components which are really rich and, and, and well-placed to respond to people who've experienced, uh, experienced trauma. We won an award. Just blow our own trumpets a little bit there. I was on a train the other day, last week, with a young woman, one of our young trainers. We were on our way to speak at a safeguarding conference. And we were just reflecting, and she was reflecting on how she felt engaging with Abbyanda had been different than services she'd been engaged with before. Um, and she talked about that actually it was our techniques and our approach um, which allowed her to speak honestly to her Abbyanda worker in a way that she'd never spoken to a worker before. Whereas previously she'd been in survival mode, lying to every professional she possibly could just to keep services at bay. But somehow she felt safe enough in our spaces to talk to us frankly. Um, but also that there was a transparency in the way that we worked with her that allowed her to take some power and control in processes, but also that we held hope that our focus on the future allowed her to see that life could be different. And we were helping her to notice her competence um, in, in order to get there. And so really, in very simple terms, our approach with young women is about shifting the central question. Rather than a deficit model where we're focusing on the problem, why is she so aggressive? Why does she keep running back even when we move her out of location? Why does she keep, and one of my favorites, keep putting herself at risk? Why is she so promiscuous? Why is she so resistant to our services? So instead of problematizing the young woman, we flip the coin and we say, wow, despite the adversity you faced, despite these awful experiences that nobody should have to experience, let alone a child, how have you managed to survive? Because actually when we flip that coin, what we do is we open up a whole tapestry of resources, of skills, of strategies that that young woman has been deploying to navigate that adversity she faces in her life and actually to walk through the door and sit in front of us and spend time with us um, as a service provider. Um, I'm going to leave you with a story about a young woman. One of the first, when I was delivering our one-to-one -one service, when I was delivering and not behind the scenes, um, one of the first young women who came through the STAR project, which is our one-to-one -one service, um, was referred in because she'd threatened an associate with a bladed article. And there was a whole story behind that, as you would expect. This is a young woman who was diagnosed with depression when she was 13 and lived with depression and anxiety since then, and severely bullied from when she went into secondary school. She had two brothers, older brothers, who were gang nominals, and they'd been in and out of prison uh, because of drug dealing. So she was at risk because of elements and dynamics there, of course. And she was raped by a male associate who lived over the road from her family home. The first time she committed suicide was by trying to jump off the roof of a building. The second time she tried to commit suicide was by tying the cord of a sports bag around her neck and trying to hang herself in a toilet cubicle. I told her in a session, look, I've been given this information by your probation worker, and in honor of transparency, because of the way we work, you need to know that I know this information about you. I know that you were raped. And I said to her, you can talk about that now, you can talk about that later, or you can never talk about it at all. It's completely your choice. And what happened was she talked 
about it in abundance, because somebody was legitimizing her experience, because somebody was believing her when police charges had been dropped. So we had that conversation, and I said to her, so what does it tell you about you? What does it tell you about yourself? that despite all of those experiences, you've been able to survive and walk through the door and sit here and have these conversations with me today. And she said this. I never knew I was so powerful. And that's what we're about, helping young women to recognize their competence and their power to achieve their potential. We're growing. If you're interested in hearing more and coming along for the ride, then please do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm Lucy Shuker. I'm based at the International Centre researching child sexual exploitation, violence and trafficking. And, and we're based at the University of Bedfordshire. And um, it's a very long room, and I didn't know that when I made these slides, so I'm really sorry if you can't see these. But while I'm talking, there's just going to be a rotating presentation of some comics that we recently uh, commissioned an artist to produce, illustrating a series of principles, ten principles, that came out of a, of a review of our research with young people about what they say matters to them when they engage with professionals uh, because of concerns about CSE. Um, so just, I'll, I'll refer back to it again in, in a moment, but just so you know what that is that's, that's going around on the screen. So we've been researching CSE, child sexual exploitation, for about 10 years now uh, at the University of Bedfordshire. And as you will have uh, no doubt noticed too, we have seen a significant increase in people's willingness to acknowledge CSE, to resource looking at it and in, in, and in practice responses improving in the last few years. And we now identify a range of harms, of forms of risk that affect young people, uh, each of which sometimes may have in, in a local authority their own professional lead, their own strategy, their own team, their own service, if you're lucky, their own protocol, um, whether it's CSE or domestic violence or harmful sexual behaviour, or forced marriage, or county lines and gangs, trafficking, radicalization. And one of the things that we're noticing, uh, it's beginning to shift maybe in, in the last couple of years, um, is, is an awareness that many of these forms of harm and these forms of risk, um, there are overlapping vulnerabilities, uh, overlapping needs of victims, overlapping contexts that give rise to some of these forms of, of harm, and, and overlapping dynamics in, in terms of the form of, of exploitation. And many of those are related to uh, the fact that they impact adolescents. And so uh, I just want to draw out three aspects of our research that uh, I think are uh, just are interesting, curious, I think, to note around thinking about uh, what is it about adolescence and how, and how do we take account of it when we're thinking about how we overcome, what some of the barriers are to overcoming and addressing exploitation and also what, what some of the solutions might be. And certainly with child sexual exploitation, although we, we, we know that the, ident the age at which young people are being identified as getting younger and that is in part a good thing uh, because that means ideally there is early intervention and help there. Uh, we are still predominantly talking about um, average age being around 14, 15 when, when uh, referrals first come in. So we are talking about teenagers. So firstly, the first thing I want to just note is that we are using processes and systems in terms of child protection that were not designed for teenagers. Uh, they were designed to respond to risk to children who were much younger, uh, usually faced by uh, them in the home context and, and, and where risk is faced by the parents or posed by parents. So recently we conducted a survey of professionals based in London who work with children and young people, asking them about their opinions and their experiences of safeguarding adolescents and how well procedures support them with that. And we asked them to tell us how far they agreed with the statement that, that current child protection procedures adequately address how to safeguard adolescents who've experienced or are at risk of experiencing significant harm caused by parents and carers. And 84% said that they agreed. These child protection procedures, they're adequate to that task. And then we asked, uh, what about 
significant harm or risk of harm posed by children or peers um, in public spaces and in online contexts. And those who agreed with that statement, uh, the numbers went down to 37%. So quite a significant drop. And that's a problem because the exploitation of teenagers is rarely facilitated by parents in the home. It is happening in school toilets. It's happening in the stairwells of shopping centers. It's happening in the local park. Um, and it's happening in bus stations. We then asked how confident professionals were at identifying risk in these different contexts. And again, when we asked about children and peers online, uh, the number of professionals who, who agreed that they were confident they could identify that risk was about 57%. And if you remember the figure for those who were confident in the adequacy of the procedures, that was about 37%. So we, we've got a mismatch where professionals are more confident in their own practice when it comes to working with contexts of risk outside the family home than they are in the procedures that are meant to be supporting them and directing their practice. And I think that probably uh, suggests something which you may well have experienced to be true, that a lot of the time it is professional judgment, experience, tenacity and creativity in working around procedures that enables you to protect adolescents and teenagers rather than the tools that you may be given uh, yourselves. And we know that youth offending teams actually probably have more experience than most agencies in, in activities like peer network mapping of actually asking, well, okay, this this referral has come from the, for this person, but who are their associates? And doesn't that case link to this case because child A was with child B when child B was attacked in this context and they're related to this person? And you have more experience than most agencies in doing that. But uh, we are not in a world where children's social care, for example, are confident even in the legality of recording the, the network mapping that they might be doing on the back of an envelope because we don't have systems that um, allow us legally to record uh, details of children without inf informing their parents or, or people that they're, uh, that they're associating with. So we are not yet in a place where our, where our procedures lend themselves well to um, robustly identifying all those teenagers who may be at risk in contexts outside the home. And if you're interested in that contextual safeguarding piece, uh, the, the session after the break, is, we're going to go into that in a lot more detail. The second area is, I, th I think, we're still in a world where our perception of adolescence, uh, we research is still suggesting and showing that uh, certainly professionals are not confident uh, in, in many of those they work with, that we, are, we understand the dynamics of how abuse impacts teenagers, how it affects their behaviour, and therefore how we should interpret that and how we respond that we're still struggling to recognise that adolescents have the same rights to protection as younger children, and we're misdiagnosing some of the symptoms of abuse as uh, typical teenage behaviour. And so we're still seeing and hearing phrases being used like, will not engage, hard to reach, putting that responsibility, as Abby says, on the child or the young person, um, and using that as, as an excuse sometimes not to pursue work with that child and that young person. So examples that I'm sure you'll be aware of already. The sexual exploitation of boys is less likely to be recognised than girls because we associate masculinity with power and control and not with victimhood. 16 and 17 year olds are still being assumed to be consenting to sex if they say they are, despite the fact that we know consent is still irrelevant if a child has been sexually exploited. And the Children's Society did a great piece of research um, around the vulnerability of 16 and 17 year olds in particular. Over the legal age of consent, still children um, most likely to experience sexual assault and least likely for that assault to be prosecuted of recorded offences. And then thirdly, interpreting things like silence or aggression um, not as uh, behaviour to be curious about but as... Uh, being taken as resistance, resistance to help. Although that silence may, as Abby has sort of suggested, and our research backs up, that silence is very often a way for a, for a young person, a child who has experienced extreme disempowerment, to retain some kind of control over who knows what and where and who, which professionals are involved in their life. Or uh, misinterpreting or not understanding that aggression may well be a symptom of trauma. 
So we unfortunately still hear these phrases, he chose, she chose, to explain why no intervention is needed or a young person doesn't seem to want help. So we, we know, for example, that the notion of constrained choice is really important. It's not just about choice or no choice, it's about constrained choice. And uh, if, if you're interested in thinking more about that, I would recommend um, the social model of consent. If you've not come across that, my, my colleague Jenny Pierce has produced this fantastic model that helps us understand how choices are constrained. And so a piece of work that we've done to respond to some of these challenges recently, uh, something called the CSE and Policing Knowledge Hub, brought together our research evidence with the College of Policing and developed a series of resources for police officers, including a briefings around trauma-informed approaches to policing that would begin to challenge some of that practice um, and, and uh, move away from maybe perceptions of victims of being streetwise, of being mini-adults, things like that. And then thirdly, that services that young people and professionals value are not sufficiently valued or resourced. And we had one response to that survey of professionals that said, you can't protect adolescents if you can't engage them. That's quite a provocative statement, and I'm not sure I would agree, because I think we've got victimless prosecutions that show that that's not the case. If a child does not want to engage with you, it's still your job to protect them, to do everything within your power and your um, partner's power to do that. But there is something in that, which is... As children's capacity and their independence increases, we need to put more and more resources into services that can engage children and young people that may be distrustful, rightfully, of services. And we need to understand why they might not want to engage. And Abby's given us some great examples of that. So these cartoons, these comics, and these principles um, came from young people's voices and saying, well, this is what's important to me. And one of them, um, it's the young person picking thoughts out of their mind and putting them down on the table. And the principle is, give us time. We might have lots of thoughts to process. Don't rush us into disclosure. Just let us go at, go at our pace. And another piece of research we've conducted this year really underlines the importance, actually, of statutory and voluntary sector partnerships in working in the ways that young people value. So we've just completed a, a big three-year evaluation of child sexual exploitation services across 35 local authorities. And there was consensus across the 146 stakeholders that we interviewed that the voluntary sector have a really key role to play in responding uh, to exploitation. And it's because their independence means that they can work in flexible ways. They can often work in longer term ways with victims. Um, the kinds of putting on the Disney film, going and getting your bacon butty, the flexible kinds of working that often other agencies do not have the capacity or the protocols to do. Although if you do do that, that's fantastic. Um, so flexibility, independence, trust building with young people and empowering approaches. And young people say they value those, other professionals say they really value those partnerships. And crucially, I think, one of the dimensions of that is physical spaces that young people say are theirs. And I think this is a bit of a challenge because we're increasingly seeing, and rightfully so, voluntary sector workers in co-located teams responding to exploitation. But what we gain from information sharing and those sorts of partnerships, we do potentially lose from spaces, drop-ins, that uh, young people identify as their space where they can, in their own place, uh, build relationships with workers and disclose and talk about their experiences if they want to and meet with other young people as well. And, of course, the challenge and the barrier of, of all of that is that the funding um, for many of these services remains insecure, unsustainable, and at, and at odds, actually, with the longer-term approach that these services take and which is their reported strength. So three barriers I just wanted to... Um, to sort of identify, and, and obviously there are opportunities in each of those as well, around thinking about adolescence and exploitation, um, reforming our child protection system so that we think about risk outside the home, challenging language and perception that writes off behaviour rather than seeing it as a reason to be curious, and access to services that are uh, working in ways that young people value and other agencies value as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Jim Hatton. I'm a DS from Leicestershire Police. Uh, I think you'll all agree the standard of speaking so far has been absolutely excellent. It's about to nosedive now. <laughs> I'm absolutely humbled to be asked to come and speak alongside experts because certainly Naz Nazir, Abby and Lucy are all experts in their field. 
I'm anything but an expert in the field. I'm an expert in a number of things. I can ask, answer any question you want about Leicester City. <laughs> I can tell you how much it costs to get married here, all sorts of things <laughs> like that. But in terms of work around urban street gangs and preventing the progression to serious and organised crime, we're still very much finding the feet as a force. So in the autumn of 2006, uh, Leicestershire had an inspection from Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary around organised crime, and we came out as being good. Must be true, because HMIC say so. The gap was, what comes before OCGs? So then we started to do a bit of research around urban street gangs, and the theme I'll keep cutting across throughout this presentation, I'll keep using the word exploitation. Like with most pieces of research, they all begin with a Google search. So I Googled the term urban street gang, and it was quite interesting because these are the images that brought back uh, as the top three images on Google. So I saved them thinking that would be useful for one day. And sure enough, I wanted to delve deeper to see, actually, what are urban street gangs? Is it as straightforward as that? So in terms of what we've got in Leicestershire, we, 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 are, we manage OCGs using, I apologise, I'll use police terms, I'm not used to public speaking, as I said, we manage organised crime groups, which are, as with these things, ACPO have a def definition of it, but essentially groups of criminals working together in an organised way to commit serious crime, drug dealing, uh, importation of firearms, perhaps newer offences such as child sexual exploitation, trafficking of people, uh, burglary, robbery. So Leicestershire work within the guidelines of the National uh, OCG Management Mechanism and we've got 37 OCGs in Leicestershire at the moment. Each OCG is given a score and it's managed in order to the priority. And as with these things, we have a model around managing it which focuses on what's called the four Ps. So the first one being pursuing people. I think it's fairly obvious that as a police service, we're there to prosecute people that commit crime and put them in prison. Perhaps other areas of the four P plan that historically we've not been as good at is preventing people from engaging in criminality. Protecting communities from serious and organised crime and preparing for people to become involved in serious and organised crime. So if we talk about the pursue, over the years, and as 15 years as a police officer, I've smashed in my fair share of doors, arrested my fair share of people and put people in prison. What I never thought about until probably about three years ago was what is the impact on the family? What siblings and what children are in that household that are affected by the organised crime and by the police activity. What's the impact on the wider community? Because research has shown that organised crime groups are very, very good at what they do. If we take out a drugs network, then it's likely that organised crime groups are researching on the internet, say who's getting convicted, where the gaps in the market are, and often results in power voids voids which result in power struggles and that's when we get violence. So importantly, what about prevention? And I think Noel made the point earlier and he was absolutely right with what he said. He's not interested in financial hardship and stuff like that. I completely agree with him. But actually it makes economic sense to prevent people from becoming involved in serious and organised crime in the first place because it costs a lot of money to keep people in prison. So if we can stop people becoming involved in it, not only have you got the, the human factors, you've also got the financial factors. So I did a little bit of digging, and I decided that... I, I thought to myself, those involved in organised crime don't wake up one day and just make a, a choice, I'm going to be an organised criminal. It because, there's a whole complicated process that leads to that, whole number of factors. 
I grew up on an estate about two miles away from here called the Saffron Lane Estate, and it was a very, very different time. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, although I don't look it. <laughs> Crime. <laughs> yeah, I'm 37, believe it or not. Crime was very, very different back in the 90s. And even in the early noughties, it was very different. It's evolved a lot, as has the complexities around the progression into serious and organised crime. Now, I'd like to try and take credit for this piece of academic research that, that's in front of you, uh, but I can't because I can't scrub Greater Manchester Police out of the top left-hand corner. <laughs> uh, essentially, this plots the, the pathway into serious and organised crime, starting with youth peer groups, and a phrase that I don't particularly like, but delinquent peer groups, who become involved in antisocial behaviour, through to problematic peer groups involved in low-level criminality, urban street gangs, before becoming the end product, which is, which is an organised crime group. What we're experiencing in Leicestershire is the same as the national picture, which is increasing numbers of children becoming involved in organised crime groups. I think the average age for a conviction nationally for, for an OCG member for the first serious crime is 32 years old. The reality is Leicestershire, we're experiencing that much younger. Again, as with nationally, we're, exper we're experiencing an increase in the incidence of knife crime. And if you look in the news recently for Leicestershire, we've had a number of high profile convictions for murders involving knife crime. Although I'm not a big one for, for, for theories and stuff like that, I think this diagram, it perhaps gives as good as it gets in terms of plotting what is a complicated journey, taking into account all kinds of sociological factors from being a child on the street or a child in the home becoming involved in serious and organised crime. What we're seeing in Leicestershire again is similar to what's seen nationally, we're seeing individuals who are involved in problematic peer groups and urban street gangs being exploited by organised crime groups. Again, I use the term exploited. I make no bones about that. These are children who are being used to deal drugs, to carry weapons, to store firearms. And what we're, what we're seeing is it's almost a talent pool for organised crime groups to go into. So I pose a question to you all. I don't know you all to answer it, but is a 15-year-old running drugs, are they a criminal or are they a victim of exploitation? <coughs> to follow up the, the, the research, I did a bit of research on my own, I looked at a couple of our most prevalent organised crime groups in Leicestershire and did the research going through purely from police databases to see can I plot a, pla plot a, plot a pathway through from being a child into organised crime. So this one, the first boy I'm going to talk about, in 2005, this lad's 13. He receives a final warning for a low-level assault in the playground. I'm sure people in the room will remember final warnings as being a particular, I think it was judicial disposal was the correct term back in the day. It's safe to say that that was dealt with by the police and youth offending. If we, look, if we looked at that now, we'd look at that differently. Because if I was to say to you, this 13-year-old boy, his dad was in prison, he was an OCG member, he wasn't going to school, his older brothers and sisters were linked to drug supply, we'd perhaps look at that very, very differently now to how we looked at things then. 2007, by now the boy's 15, he receives a warning for possession of cannabis and twock, which is a posh way of saying he took his mum's car without asking. Again, dealt with by youth offending and the police. By 2008, 16-year-old boys convicted of possession with intent to supply, controlled drugs, and arrested for numerous Section 18 GBHs, which are serious assaults. At this point, a local PBO, who, which is a, a local beat officer, who'd been in the police for a number of years, says there's something wrong about this lad, he's going to go off the rails. And it's safe to say 
having had the, done this presentation with members of the City Youth Offending Board, they all, they all shared a similar view at that point. 2009, 17-year-old boy, convicted of supplying crack cocaine and sentenced to two years in prison. 2011, number of street robberies. By 2014, the man's involved with a, a, an organised crime group that becomes involved with a, in a, with a criminal dispute with a rival organised crime group. This is a story that, that it could play out, it just happened, this played out in Leicester, but it could happen anywhere. In 2015, the man was arrested for attempted murder involving a uh, firearm being discharged at an innocent member of the public. The dispute that he was involved with, he'd gone to the flats where his rival lived, saw a bloke who he thought was his rival walking out of his flat, getting into his car. Shoots a gun through the window and stabs him and realises it's the wrong bloke. Fortunately, the victim was absolutely fine and made a full recovery, but our OCG member was sentenced to 12 years in prison. So if you have a look back at that, if we look through the lens backwards, there's opportunities there to have made a difference with that boy's life and potentially take him away from a life of serious and organised crime. And if we look at the rival, the person who he was aiming to shoot and stab, 2005, he's an eight-year-old. He's punched a nine-year-old boy in the face, causing a nosebleed. That was dealt with by the police as a single agency at the time, as was the processes back in the day. 2008, by now the boy's 11, he punches and racially abuses a man in the street. It was dealt with by what's known as restorative justice at that time. 2009, the boy committed a number of street robberies, again, dealt with by restorative justice. Later in 2009, a 12-year-old boy is charged with an ABH, which is the first time there is youth offending intervention and any other agency intervening with our young boy. 2010, the police attend a verbal incident with this boy's mother. By 2011, there's seven separate reports of antisocial behaviour linking this boy to a local gang. Again, a local beat officer, wily old cop, has said, this lad and his mates are going to cause us a problem in a few years' time. I don't agree in the end, but he wasn't wrong. 2011, multiple robberies. 2012, age 14, there's an increased incidence of gang-related violence. In 2014, this boy is involved in the kidnap of a rival OCG member. In 2015, he discharged a firearm at his rival's address and he's convicted of a number of GBHs. And again, the final bit is perhaps the most impactive. The OCG that the boy is involved in and that group of kids that were being a nuisance involved in ASB, two of them have been convicted of murder and are serving life. One of them has been convicted of GBH and was involved in quite a sophisticated drugs network that was essentially exploiting young children on the north of the county. And two have been involved in firearms offences. So the point I'm making is, could the model that I stole from Greater Manchester, could that have been overlaid to have prevented these, these boys from becoming involved in serious and organised crime? We're keen to try and break the cycle and again, there's a need for more sophisticated planning and coordination. I just noticed Nazir is giving me the evil eye, so I'll <laughs> rock it through a little bit. There is a definition of an urban street gang, which I won't go through that. I'll go straight on to the current position of Leicestershire. <laughs> what we've got in Leicestershire, because that's what you all want to know, what you've got. We've got 
two groups are identified on a particular neighbourhood as being somewhere on the gang continuum. Whether they're urban street gangs, problematic peer groups, it's difficult to say. And to be honest, I don't really care. What I want to do is to try and get those children the help and support they need to try and prevent them from progressing into serious and organised crime. Again, we've got one group that's been newly identified on neighbourhood B, which is the north part of the county. And we've got a group that's being mapped and currently being assessed by the intelligence people. I think limitations is that it's all been mapped. The initial stage of mapping has been done using police data. Clearly, as the police, we think we know a lot, but I'm acutely aware we perhaps don't know as much as we should or as we think we do. There's people in this room who are going to know a lot, lot more than we do. I suspect those people that have been involved from the other side of it perhaps know how little the police actually do know. Again, with the groups we've got, these groups have heavy links to organised crime groups. One of the boys from Neighbourhood Team A, his older brother is involved in an OCG and children from one of the gangs are being actively used by the OCG in order to run drugs and commit crime. We're trying to get the message across and brief key partners. I know people from the city and county youth offending for Leicester have heard this all before from me, so I apologise for it. But deliver briefings to YOS, to children's services, and to representatives of the Youth Justice Board, which is why I got the invite today. And I think a real a real movement forward for us, and Nazir made the point about sharing of information, the strategic and uh, tactical problem profiles that we've produced around the children within these groups, we're now sharing them with partners to try and help manage the risk. Not only are we sharing the information about the actual children involved, we're also trying to develop that and sharing information about siblings so we can try and get ahead of what's going to happen in the future. We've now identified a multi-agency review forum for the urban street gangs through the habitual knife carriers. We use a risk assessment process to risk assess the intent and capability of each urban street gang. As with these things, we shopped around, we looked to try and beg, borrow and steal before we looked at actually what makes these groups risky to, to us, to the communities and ultimately to the children themselves. We decided links to, links to OCGs, being in conflict with other gangs, conflict within the own gang, and the use of weapons are all factors that mean they can have fatal consequences. In terms of results so far, the urban street gangs that we have mapped out are managed on a, on a neighbourhood level, and the reason for that is, like more metropolitan areas, Leicester's broken up, Leicester and Leicestershire's broken up into a number of boroughs and parish type council areas, and there's a a lottery depending where you live as to what provisions are available to support you. We're now undertaking routine strategy discussions around children involved or at risk of gang related violence, which is something that, that kind of tags on to the child sexual exploitation. We set up a, a safeguarding hub that has police, social services, school nurses involved and we're now using that to, as a gateway through to social care and to other services. We're better identifying child-related vulnerability and understanding exploitative behaviour. We're now considering, are children victims here or are they criminally, uh, are, are they criminally culpable? One of, one of the roles I have is uh, a DS that oversees the, safe, the human trafficking, modern slavery side Leicestershire Police, I got asked to review a job with a 16-year-old Vietnamese boy who was a gardener in a cannabis factory. Police officers come to me for some advice over it and they want to charge this lad. My view is, what are you doing? We've got a 16-year-old boy here who is miles, thousands of miles away from home, doesn't speak any language. Clearly, he's being exploited and being put into that position and actually we took the brave decision, or I took the decision, not to charge him and to refer him through to the national referral mechanism and treat him as a victim. Sadly, we were unable to get upstream and identify who was exploiting him, but 
it was represented a bit of a change in culture shift. We've also mapped new OCGs. Moving forward, we're looking to develop a multi-agency protocol focusing on safeguarding children affected by gang-related violence. What we want to do, we want to share all the information and intelligence with each other. We want to better understand and manage risk. And importantly, what it's all about is safeguarding the kids. We utilise the multi-agency forum to review the groups. And now we include children at risk of becoming involved in serious and organised crime as an agenda item at the OCG management meeting. So I'd just like to finish on this particular note. Gang and gang culture is a complex issue. People in this room will understand it a lot better than me. But certainly me and my colleagues in Leicestershire, we're focused on, on dealing with those people that cause the most harm and protecting vulnerable people. We need to learn and develop how to do that. We need to evolve our processes. And I'll happily take any feedback about how we can do that. But just to finish on, I think it's important to consider our gang members, are they criminals or are they children that are being exploited? They're my contact details if I've not bored you enough. Thank you for listening. very much. I think that's been a really clear overview that will help us go forward into our workshops that are coming up shortly. I didn't want to lose the opportunity just to ask the panel really in a minute to give us the one thing that if you had the opportunity that you would change to help us tackle this issue of exploitation uh, much better. Uh, so I'll give you a few moments to think about that. I mean from my perspective a couple of bits of words, language that I will throw out to you all that I think we need to hold on to. Language around choice, consent, blame. How do we start from a position of belief? What are those safe spaces that we're talking about? How do we think about relationship and relationship education and understanding at a very early age? And how do we really think through issues such as gender equality? So I'm going to just start here, James. One thing you would change if you had that power to change it. I think I take Nazir's point, and I agree completely with what Nazir says about the sharing of information and perhaps the fear of data protection amongst some professionals, perhaps not people in this room, because uh, I think people being here are committed to uh, developing, learning, and better understanding. But that fear of what people can and they can't say uh, ultimately is a barrier to safeguarding people and to uh, preventing further harm. Thank you. Abby? There's loads, but I think going back to what Noel said earlier, it's having those people who've been affected by problems embedded at policy level to make sure there's a trickle-down effect and a, a delivery of services and commissioning of services that reflect the realities of people's lives. Thank you. Uh, Lucy? Um, I, I, the same, but so, so a practical suggestion would be to have um, a unit sitting within Department for Education staffed entirely by young people. Um, who would direct and advise about the, implica the, the implementation of sex and relationships education mm -hmm. and how to achieve gender inequality through, uh, gender equality through schools. Yeah. Thank you. And Nazir? Uh, I agree with what Nazir said earlier on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, my, my takeaway is about what leaders can do. Um, because any organisation is only as good as the, uh, the leaders and what the leaders allow to happen and how they, what they encourage. And, uh, particularly when you've got resources that are, are limited, uh, to celebrate those of you who work with young people. There is nothing uh, more important than the next generation. Nothing. Uh, and yet we pay bankers more. We, we don't give you the appreciation you deserve. And I think we need to keep recognizing each other for the work we do. And leaders need to create the culture where that happens. Thank you very much. Can we thank our panel for their time this afternoon? Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to our coffee break and straight after coffee, hold on, can you please go directly to your workshops? Um, so at 3.35, please can you be in your workshops and then you have to come back here after your workshops, please don't leave just yet because we have got young people from Peer Power and Noel is going to be interviewing our young people, so more opportunity to hear from the voices of children and young people. Thank you all very much. <laughs>